Let's open up our Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. Here we are on Wednesday nights making our way through this month, uh, the first letter of John. And we come to chapter 3. And I, I always think this when I come through 1 John. In Ephesians, Paul gives it as an instruction, as a goal for believers that we should speak the truth in love. Maybe you're familiar with that phrase. I mean, it's a good, helpful phrase in our Christian life. We want to speak the truth to people, but we want to do it in love. And I think that that is captured in 1 John very powerfully, very um, eloquently. Because let me tell you, in 1 John, he writes to us the truth. I mean, sometimes he speaks so plainly so simply, so convictingly that we're kind of wish there was some deeper meaning, the original Greek that would take away the conviction of what he just said to us. But there is all throughout it this, this wonderful atmosphere of love. And so let's take a look at this. First John chapter three, we're gonna begin now at verse one where he says, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. You know, there's many verses like this in this entire letter of 1 John. There's a flow. There's an argument. There's there's an idea being built out from beginning to end. But you could take individual verses from this letter and build so much upon it. Just this one single verse. But first of all, look at what he tells us to do. Simply to behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. You see, right in the previous verse, at the end of 1 John chapter 2, he mentioned the idea of being born of him. And this seems to prompt the idea of saying, well, what does it mean that we're born of him? Listen, it makes us children of God. And he's simply saying, behold this. Look at this, people. We are called the children of God. And this displays the greatness of God's love. I want you to think about how powerful that is. Now, God might have looked down upon the sorry state of humanity in separation from him. He might have looked down on sorry humanity and said, I want to help. I want to do something good for them. I want to rescue them. Now just imagine in your mind someone in our community who's just really down and out. I mean, good heavens, our church is right across the street from the rescue mission. We, we, we see people in our midst, we're familiar with this, people who are down and out. And let's say out of great compassion, somebody were to reach out to somebody who's down and out and they would come and they'd say, okay, look, this is what I'm gonna do. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pay off all your debts I'm going to take care of all your obligations before the law. I'm going to set you in a right standing. I'm going to fix things up with your family. I'm going to to fix everything. I'm going to restore what's done in the past. I'm going to do all this. And we would think, I'm going to give you a new set of clothes. I'm going to give you a new place to live. I'm going to provide for all your needs. And we think, what amazing love that would be. Who would show such love? But I'll tell you, there's something that you could do beyond all of that that none of us would even dream of. And say, I'm going to take that person, I'm going to adopt them into my family as my son or my daughter. Do you realize that's what God did for us? And and there's a sense which I'm delighted so much with this. It's like this was purely extra. And and, and God forbid that I would call anything that God does unnecessary. But there's a sense in which this is unnecessary. He didn't have to do it. God did not have to adopt you into his family in order to save your soul from hell. He didn't have to adopt you into his family in order to bring you to heaven, to forgive your sins. But on top of all of those gracious things that he's done for you, he said, you know what? Because I love you, come into my family. Now you are my child in a certain and an important way. Now, this reminds us 
that we gain something in Jesus Christ greater than what Adam, our original forefather, ever possessed. We never once read of Adam being called one of the children of God in the sense that we read about it right here. He was never adopted as a son of God in the way that the believers are. Friends, we make a huge mistake when we think of redemption as merely being a restoration of what we lost in Adam at the Garden of Eden. God's plan isn't to restore paradise lost. God's plan is to take us beyond. We gain more in Adam. Excuse me, I just really messed that up. We gain more in Jesus than we ever lost in Adam. See, now you're going to remember that though, just because I messed it up for you. See, I did you a favor with that. But isn't that wonderful? We gain more in Jesus than we ever lost in Adam. This is the riches of God's love. And do you see how wonderful it is that he just says, behold, look at this. Think about it for a few moments. But then there's a price to receiving and walking in this love. Look at what he says there right there in verse one. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. We should expect that the world would treat us as it treated Jesus Christ himself. There's a difficult thing for us to deal with as Christians. I I hope I can explain it adequately. Here's the difficult thing. We all know that we can and should be better followers of Jesus Christ. Don't raise your hand if you know that's you. Just kind of, you can sit on your hands, but I'm just gonna assume it all around this room. We know that we can and should be better followers of Jesus Christ. And sometimes it's put upon us that the reason why the world rejects Christianity is because we're such rotten Christians. Now friends, I'm going to agree that that's certainly possible. It's possible for somebody to live such a rotten Christian life that it sours other people on Christianity. That's possible. But may I remind you, you could live a beautifully faithful Christian life and what would it be said of you? 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. So we shouldn't think that if the world rejects Christians and Christianity, it's because they're doing such a rotten job living like Jesus. Even though we all live with that aching awareness that we can and should do better, but we recognize that a sinless man came to this world and lived and walked among us and humanity couldn't wait to spit in his face and crucify him. It's sobering, is it not? Now, verse two. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. I love this idea here. We are children of God. Don't you love the certainty of that phrase there in verse two? Not we will be children of God, we are right now. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's what Paul wrote in Romans chapter eight, verse 16. And the next phrase, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Our present standing as disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ is plain. We are children of God. We understand that. But our destiny, that is still cloudy. We can't even imagine what we're going to be like in the age to come. But this is what we do know. Look again at verse 2. We know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We're not completely left in the dark about our future state. When Jesus is revealed... Either by his coming to us or our going to him, when Jesus is revealed, we shall be like him. Now, even though we as believers are to grow into the image of Jesus Christ right now, we should be coming, to use a good word, we should be coming more and more Christ-like 
in our conduct, but there's going to come a day when that's perfected, when we will be glorified and we will surely be like him. And why? Look at that phrase in verse two. It's so powerful. We shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. This is what makes heaven heaven. To see Jesus as he is. Now friends, you uh, attend this church. I, I suppose you do. You attend this church and you have it impressed upon you again and again and again that you need to know who Jesus is and the fundamental way we know Jesus is by learning how he has revealed himself to us in this book. And this is powerful in this view, but I've got news for you. None of us beholds Jesus perfectly now. None of us. The greatest Bible scholar, the most accurate biblical interpreter, they're still cloudy, fuzzy, imprecise. We do the best we can with it, but we realize that there's a distance between the very best we can understand Jesus in the here and now and how perfectly we will understand him on that day. And won't that be one of the chief glories of heaven? To simply sit back with the knowledge and just say, I know him as well as he knows me. I can know him. We shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So here's the idea. The two things are tied together. The more you see Jesus as he really is, the more you'll be like him. So the more we grow in our understanding of who Jesus is right here and right now, there's a transforming effect that has on our life now. And it'll be perfected one day. Verse three and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Knowing our eternal destiny, having our hope set in the right place, purifies our life. And I love how he phrases it. Everyone who has this hope in him. Friends, fundamentally, our hope is not in heaven. Now, it's a wonderful destination. We're looking for it. We anticipate it. But our hope is in Jesus. You know what makes heaven heaven? Jesus is there. And so our hope fundamentally is in him. And our uniting together with him in perfection. Now, it might seem that at verse four, John shifts gears pretty abruptly. But I think after painting the glories of our becoming more and more like Jesus and then the perfection of that when we see him, John's gonna help us deal with things that might hinder our knowledge of God right now. He's gonna deal with sin. So remember I talked to you about speaking the truth in love? Fasten your seatbelt here, right here, verse four. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Here John simply defines sin as its most basic root. It's a disregard for the law of God. And when you disregard the law of God, you're disregarding the law giver, that is God himself. Now, can I say, I'm looking out here tonight on a room full of lawless sinners. That's all of you. Okay, it's me too, I, I admit it as well. We're just all in this together. But notice the next part of the verse, that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. This is the mission of Jesus, again expressed in its most basic root. I love how it's described in Matthew chapter one, verse 21, the angel Gabriel promised Joseph, you'll call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin. That's why he was manifested, to take away our sin, to deal with our sin problem. And this is the work of Jesus, to deal with the penalty of sin, to deal with the 
power of sin in an ongoing sense in our life and one day to even take away the presence of sin in our life. It's all the work of Jesus. That's why he was manifested to take away our sins. Now, that being the case, look at verse six. It's a logical step from verses four and five. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now friends, since sin is lawlessness, we saw that back in verses four and five, since Jesus came to take away our sins, since in Jesus there is no sin, then to abide in Jesus means you don't sin. All right, now we need to walk some careful ground here. Because the truth that John tells us is really important, but it's possible to misunderstand it. And throughout church history, people have misunderstood. They've misunderstood this in the sense of thinking that we can come to a place of sinless perfection. And, you know, people tell stories about this. People have come to this idea. Perfectionism, sometimes it's called. So supposedly, and this might just be a preacher story, but it's a good preacher story, so I can't tell you whether or not it really happened, but it's a good story, so let's pretend that it did. Charles Spurgeon was, you know, speaking with somebody there one time, and, and the guy insisted that, that, that he had reached perfection, you know, in his abiding with Jesus, and he didn't sin anymore. And Spurgeon was quite startled by this. He said, oh, you, you mean, tell me you haven't sinned for quite, when's the last time you sinned? And he goes, well, it was like eight years ago. I'm, no, I'm just throwing this at some figure. Eight years ago was the last time I sinned. And supposedly, again, it's probably just a story, but it's a good one. Spurgeon took a glass of water and dumped it over the guy's head. And, and the man became very irate and said some things that someone who's abiding in Jesus should not say. And supposedly, Spurgeon just roared with laughter and said, there's eight years of sinless perfection down the drain. <laughs> so the, the wrong way to take this is it's just to come to an idea that, that sinless perfection on this side of eternity is possible. That's not the idea. The idea is simply this. <laughs> Nobody ever sinned because they were too close to Jesus. I was so abiding in Jesus that I sinned. That just doesn't happen. The greater our abiding in the sinless one, the less we will sin. You see, none of us perfectly abides. I hope that we all generally abide in Jesus, but we want to abide in him closer and closer and live in closer and closer communion with him. And it's just really that simple. No one ever sinned because they were abiding in Jesus. And can you imagine? You're abiding in the sinless one. How would that ever lead you into sin? No, when we do sin... It's because there's a problem. Maybe it's a small problem. Maybe it's a great problem with our abiding in him. Now, John's message is plain and it's consistent with the rest of the scriptures. And it also tells us this, that a lifestyle of habitual sin is inconsistent with a lifestyle of abiding in Jesus Christ. Friends, I just need to say it simply and plainly. If you are abiding in sin, you're living in known, recognized, unconfessed sin, then you're not abiding in Jesus Christ the way that you could be. You're just not. The two are incompatible. I'm not saying you lost your salvation. I'm saying there's some kind of interruption with your fellowship with Jesus Christ. That needs to be cleared out of the way. So that you can walk with him in that abiding relationship. You see, for us as believers, the question is not, do you sin or not? Of course we sin. The question is, how do we react when we sin? Do we allow it to become a pattern and dominate our lifestyle? Or do we humbly confess our sin and battle against it with the power that only Jesus can give? You see, this is the idea carried on to verse 7 now. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, 
just as he is righteous. Again, a very much a parallel idea. John isn't trying to tell us that we're made righteous before God because of our righteous acts. But if we're abiding in the righteous one, it's going to show in our lives. You know, no, nobody ever said, um, you know, I was abiding so close to Jesus that I just committed X, Y, Z sin. That I just practiced this form of unrighteousness. When we're abiding in the sinless one, we won't be walking in sin. When we're abiding in the righteous one, we're going to practice righteousness. Now he examines it from the other side here, verses 8 and 9. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So again, people who are settled in habitual sin are not living as the children of God, they're living of the devil. And Jesus came to destroy those works. Matter of fact, I love how he puts it right here. He came that he might destroy the works of the devil. Not, you know, roll them back a little bit or lessen the effects of the devil or that, no, but to destroy the works of the devil. And again, this change from being of the devil to being a child of God, how does it happen? Look at that phrase in verse nine. Whoever has been born of, of God this is the exciting truth that when we are born again born from above when we are born of God a new nature is given to us in Jesus Christ where once we were uh, patterned after the old man Adam himself now we receive a new nature patterned after Jesus Christ himself and in that new nature we have the power to walk in a way that is not perfect, but is pleasing to God and can be free from the habitual practice of sin. Look at how strongly he puts it here. He says here, whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed remains in him. When we're born again, something changes. To quote Spurgeon again, he said something along these lines. He put it in the negative. The grace that does not change my life will not save my soul. In other words, the grace that God gives unto salvation is a life-changing grace. And it means that sin does not dominate that person as once before. Now, here's the way that I would summarize this idea for you. Let me try this out on you. Ready? That a Christian cannot be comfortable in habitual sin. Now, did I say that a Christian cannot practice habitual sin? Well, I... I think that Christians can have habits of sin. But here's the thing. A Christian who has a habit of sin will be tormented in the midst of it. Your conscience, the Holy Spirit, will war with you. You, you will not have a peace. You will not have an ease about it. You, you may cover it up with a smile, but on the inside, you're churning. You're not at peace with it. You cannot have peace in habitual sin. This is the life of transformation that happens for a believer and as we continue to walk with the Lord that war that goes on with us says I either got to get this habitual sin right before God or or I don't know what I'm going to do it's just not consistent with who I am in Jesus Christ anymore friends if someone can be comfortable in known habitual sin it's a danger signal. 
It's like a dashboard light on your car flashing, telling you, check this, check this. This is something to be concerned about. Now again, the verb tenses that John uses here in verse 9, where he says he does not sin and he cannot sin, they have that same verb tense indicating a continual practice of habitual sin. John tells us that when we're born again, born into the family of God, there's a real change in our relation to sin. You see, folks, it is certainly possible, I, I feel strange even saying these words, okay, it's certainly possible for a Christian to sin. Isn't that a funny thing to say? Of course it is. But when we sin as believers, we act against our new nature. Is it possible for a person to act against their new nature? Yes. But there's something not comfortable about it. There's something not at peace about it. And this is what we need to understand and gain and walk in the new person that we've been made in Jesus Christ. Verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. You you see, in the first part of verse 10, he's just continuing on the idea before, but now he adds an additional idea at the end of verse 10, where he says, okay, we, we talked about righteousness and unrighteousness. Now, this simple truth, we must love our brother. Friends, this is a striking way for us to identify the children of God. We are those who love each other. Verse 11, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now again, this is something that he's emphasized before in the letter. Love one another. And I think this is fascinating. The basic Christian message is we show our love to God by loving one another. How we treat each other really matters before God. Now, here's an example for us to not follow. Look at verse 12. Not as Cain, who is of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. You see, Cain was not right with God and he hated his brother. Friends, think about this. Where there are two children of God who are both right with God, they're going to love each other. Could somebody actually say this? I'm so right with God that I can't stand you, my brother or sister in Jesus Christ. It just doesn't work like that. And then he says this, going on verses 13, 14, and 15. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life Because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Again, this is how serious it is for us to love one another. Hatred puts ourselves in a dangerous place spiritually. But love is evidence that we've passed from death to life. Now folks, you you need to ask yourself some serious questions here. Uh, Are you, are you living in hatred towards somebody? Now, first of all, let's just think of specific people, real people. Don't shout out names. In other words, I'm not talking about groups. I'm not talking about nationalities. I'm talking about specific people in your life. And you need to be 
man or woman of God enough to say, Lord, if I'm showing hatred to somebody, if if I'm harboring hatred towards somebody in my life, would you please show me so that I can deal with it? That hatred would be like a cancer. Now, what, what do you do if God convicts your heart and shows you, look, he, here's somebody that you do. You, you hate this person. Maybe it's a mild form of hatred, but you, you hate them. What do you do with that? Well, first of all, you repent before God. Repent, ask for forgiveness. And then look for ways to demonstrate love towards that other person. Well, you could pray for them. Isn't that one of the best things you can do for somebody else? Just simply pray for them. And pray for them for real, not those imprecatory prayers from the Psalms. You know, none of those Lord break their teeth in their mouth kind of prayers. (laughs) Pray for God's good and God's blessing in their life. Then ask God to show you if there's not some concrete action of good that you could do towards that person to bless them. Friends, this is a serious thing. Hatred is like a spiritual cancer. And let me tell you, it's bad when people have hatred towards groups. Oh, we hate the people from this country. We hate the people of this ethnic group. We hate the people of this or that or, you know, this community, whatever. That's bad. But let me tell you what's far worse. When we focus our hatred against individuals. That, that's really where the rubber meets the road. So yes, we, we need to ask God to deal with it, whatever hatred we might have towards groups. But don't neglect the individual. Now, in the remainder of the chapter, he's going to talk about what love truly is. Verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Wow. The greatest demonstration of love that this world, that the entire creation has ever seen was the giving of Jesus Christ at the cross. Now notice, it's because he laid down his life for us. That's what it says right there in the verse. Did I read that right? Because he laid down his life for us. Friends, let me explain it to you this way. It wasn't the death of Jesus in itself that was the ultimate demonstration of love. May I remind you that on the day Jesus died, on either side of him were two other men crucified. They died just as much as Jesus died. It wasn't the fact that Jesus died or even that he died as a noble martyr. It was that he died, look at the words there, for us in our place. As a substitute. That's what made it. The ultimate act of love. Think of it this way. Let's say you're over at the the wharf. You're over at the pier here in Santa Barbara. There you are. You're you're standing on, on, on the pier. And then suddenly a man runs right by you. And he jumps into the water. And he's flailing about in the water. And he's almost about to drown. And just before he goes under the water. He yells out. I'm giving my life for you. You're like, what? I'm up here on the pier. I'm fine. That's just weird. His death in and of itself didn't demonstrate love. But if you were drowning and that same man jumped in the water to rescue you from drowning and ended up giving his life for yours, that would be an ultimate demonstration of love. That's what Jesus did for us. Now, since we follow such a loving Messiah, look at what it says there in verse 16. We can't get away from it. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How do we lay down our lives? How do we do it? 
You know, one of the best illustrations I heard of this, I, I can't even remember where I heard it. But he said, think of your life as it represents, you know, a, a, I, I don't know, if your life represented $500. And, and, and there you have just a, you know, a, a $500 right there. And we think that laying down our life for somebody else means we throw down that $500 in a dramatic gesture, jumping in front of the bus or throwing ourselves on the hand grenade. And that's how we lay down our lives. And listen, if we ever were in such a situation, we pray that God would give us the grace to do it. But let's face it, it's pretty unlikely. Instead, what God says, he says, well, here's your $500. I'll give it to you in a sack full of quarters. And I want you to give them away one by one, bit by bit, in small, sacrificial ways every day. Now, you, you can get rid of $500 by giving away quarters every day just as much as you can by throwing it all down in one dramatic gesture. It's just as a real laying down of the life. That that's what God calls us to. Don't despise the small gestures of love and care that you do every day as a legitimate way that you lay down your life. That mom and dad struggling with the young children in the home because man, it requires a lot of them. That's laying down their life. That, 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 that couple that's dealing with their parents in their elderly years, and man, there's a lot of home care involved, and it's hard, it's ringing them out, they don't know, or they're at end-of-life care for somebody else, and man, it's really, really difficult. That's laying down the life. Doing it in a hundred small, what might seem to the world to be insignificant ways, still brings a rich reward before God, Remember what Jesus said? He said, remember that whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of mine in my name will by no means lose their reward. Friends, what's more worthless than a cup of cold water? You give somebody a cup of cold water and an hour later they're thirsty again. Then what did I accomplish with that? Jesus says, I see it and I'll reward you with it. Look, if God gives us dramatic opportunities, we pray for the grace to demonstrate love in those. But we will not despise the small, everyday opportunities he gives us to lay down our life for one another and for his glory. Verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him. How does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Don't you love how practical John is? Again, you know, when he's drawing the likeness of the greatness of Jesus' sacrifice, he didn't say, go get yourself crucified to show that you really love Jesus. He said, go help somebody who's in need. Have a heart for the needy. Share with those in need. Verse 19. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, We have confidence towards God. Do you see the love of God at work in your life? Okay, now look, perfectly? No, not perfectly. Lots of room to grow? Yes. But but do you see places in your life where you've been able to love somebody else where you wouldn't have been able to do if it wasn't Jesus working in you and through you. When you see that, it's like an assurance. Yes, Lord. As weak and as failing as I often feel myself to be, I can tell you are in fact working in my life. And that gives us, as he says there in verse 21, confidence towards God. Now, when we have this confidence towards God, look at what it leads to in verse 22. 
And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. I love how John just weaves this fabric. You know, both sides of that just intertwining. We abide in Jesus. We walk in the new nature. His love flows in our life. We're walking in greater righteousness. We're also loving one another. And as we're abiding with him, our prayers are answered. Now, why are our prayers answered when we abide in Jesus? It's not because you're better at convincing a reluctant God that he should answer your prayers. The reason why is simply this. It's because you're more in tune with what God's will is. Do you understand that the purpose of prayer is not for you to persuade God to do what you want him to do? You're kind of like a a teenager just trying to get the car borrowed from their folks or get something over on their folks. Now that, that's, that's not the idea. The idea of prayer is to align our will with God's and to pray his will into action. And the more we abide, the more we're flowing with the heart and the will of God and just effortlessly, without even knowing, we're praying according to his will and we're seeing beautiful answers to prayer. This is the fruit of of abiding in him. Let's conclude with these last two verses, verses 23 and 24. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit of whom he has given us. You know, in verse 22, he mentioned the idea of keeping his commandments. And it's almost as if John, of course, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, yeah, and about keeping his commandments, let's remind ourselves what the two greatest commandments are to put our faith in Jesus Christ. That's that phrase there, believe on him, That's not just believing that Jesus existed. It's putting your trust, your faith, your your reliance upon him. To believe on him and to love one another. You know, I'm not going to say that the Christian life is easy. But we often overcomplicate it. How about this? Based on verse 23 and 24. How about this? Trust Jesus, put your loving trust in him, and love one another. Wouldn't that answer a lot of questions for us? Wouldn't that get us through a lot of debates? No, I'm going to trust Jesus and trust him with a real loving affection, and I'm going to love others. Thank you, Lord. Now, do you see what I love this? about this letter of 1 John. That's the truth in love. He's spoken to us very plainly, hasn't he? He's really, uh, you know, brought us up short about dealing with sin and a lack of love towards other people. But he's done it with such an atmosphere of love that it just makes us say, yes, Jesus, fill my life so that you can live this life in and through me. Father, that's our prayer. And Lord, I I recognize that we can only do any of this as we're children of God. So thank you for rescuing us. Thank you for adopting us into your family. Thank you for giving us a new nature patterned after Jesus Christ. So Lord, we long to abide in you. We long to abide in your righteousness. We long to live out lives of holiness and lives of love. Help us, Lord. Recognizing that being radically like Jesus may mean that the world rejects us even more. But Lord, if that's the case, we're fine. We just love you and honor you 
and thank you for your work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.